Again, I'm Rob Entz with the Commission on Aging. I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists, and uh, then we're going to engage in a robust conversation, and then we will offer the opportunity for you to exchange with the panel over the next hour or so, um, questions that you might have, but we'll tee up some things to get the dialogue going. I've already introduced Dr. Collette, uh, and um, I don't need to say any more. I think uh, you, you did a wonderful job with your presentation, and your passion for this topic is um, engaging. So the next individual I have is a Jennifer. Right over here, Jennifer, okay. Let me get this in order. This is Irene, okay. Irene Huntsman has an MBA, a master's in theology, and is an ACPE trained chaplain. And I apologize, tell me what ACP stands for, ACPE. Oh, <laughs> didn't mean to put you I, on the I spot for that. I would have known that if you hadn't asked me right now. Association for Certified, no, Clinical Pastoral Education. Good night. Thank it's you. Clinical Pastoral Education. <laughs> Google it, right? Right. <laughs> uh, she embarked on her chaplaincy career in 2013 after working in business for many years. She completed a residence at St. Mark's ACPE program as chaplain. She sees herself providing grace and support for people in some of the worst times of their lives. She has trained chaplains in healthcare specific chaplaincy. She finds purpose in working as part of the patient care team in hospitals. She also works as a liaison advocating for patient care with outside agencies. She currently serves as director of the pastoral care department at Jordan Valley Medical Center, Jordan Valley Medical Center, West Valley Campus, Mountain Point Medical Center, all part of the Stewart Healthcare family and Mountain West Medical Center in Tooele. She's active in her church and spends her free time with her family, which includes her husband, three children, and four active grandchildren. Jack Mearsman. Jack is a compliance privacy officer for Gold Cross Services. He has worked with EMS for 23 years in Utah. Before taking his current position, he was the director of training. In addition to his duties and responsibilities at Gold Cross Services, Inc., he sits on the Utah EMS Operations Subcommittee, the JEMS EMS Today Planning Committee, Utah Falls Prevention Alliance, the EPOL Steering Committee, and Salt Lake County EMS Committee. When not dedicating his time to promoting EMS, he spends his time outdoors kayaking, hiking, camping, and connecting with nature and his family. Jennifer, welcome. Jennifer graduated from BYU with a master's in social work in 2009. She began her career in the field of substance abuse and with a chronically homeless population. She began her career in long-term care at the Provo Rehab and Nursing in 2011 and has been in the long, has, excuse me, has been in the field of long-term care ever since. Currently, she is a social service resource for Ensign Nursing Homes all over Utah. She loves the outdoors and dogs she breeds French Bulldogs, and she just became a mother December 31st, a sweet little girl. So welcome, Jennifer. And Troy Wilson. Troy is a practicing attorney with offices located in Sugar House area of Salt Lake City. His firm focuses exclusively on estate planning, administration, and elder law, including the related areas of business planning, special needs, and Medicaid planning guardianship, and probate and trust administration. Mr. Wilson holds a BS degree in finance and an MBA from the University of Utah and a JD from the S.J. Quinney College of Law. Mr. Wilson is also a certified financial planner. He is a member of the Utah State Bar Elder Law and Estate Planning Sections. He serves on the Utah Commission on Aging and is a member of Elder Council, Wealth Council, and the Financial Planning Association and the Salt Lake Estate Planning Council. Mr. Wilson has taught as an adjunct college professor, as well as many continuing education courses to attorneys, financial planners, insurance agents, and healthcare professionals, and the public on topics such as elder law, guardianship, and conservatorship, Medicaid and VA planning, estate planning, special needs planning, and probate and estate administration. So thank you, Troy, for joining us today. Appreciate having all of these panelists. We hope that in this conversation that we start to understand what is the life cycle of the Pulse Agreement. 
And what are the legal implications uh, of an agreement? We want to talk a little bit about the consequences of not having uh, created a POLT. And so I'm gonna start out by asking each of our panelists really quickly, from your career position, what was the first time you encountered a POLST? And, and just tell us a little bit about what, what that was like. Okay? All right. So um, my first time was with my mother. She is a, was a hospice nurse for 20 years, um, and she wanted to make sure that she, as she got older, she did not want to have certain things done. Um, and so I was in Denver and encountered the most form, medical order of life-sustaining life treatment. So they called it a most in Denver. And as she's going down and filling out the form, she said, now, honey, you see this box that says that I, I can give you the permission to change this? I'm not going to do that. I know you're a doctor and all, but you're not going to get permission from me. I want this followed. And I... I, I, said, I humbly said, thank you, Mom, because it actually took a burden off me. So that was actually my first. My mom passed away last June at 91 and three months and did get to enjoy hospice uh, and died at home in her comfort of her own bed. So that was, uh, that was years, years and years ago when I first, I, ha I hadn't even started my Master's of Public Health thing, but I did get going on it. So. Nice. Well, my first experience with the Pulse, interestingly enough, was my first weekend in chaplain training. And I was at St. Mark's Hospital, and um, that was where my training program was. And um, very first weekend, scared to death. Luckily, my supervisor was there. And we came into a situation where uh, the patient was in ICU, and um, the family didn't agree. The, the patient, the doctor was convinced that the patient didn't want additional care. But there were family members who didn't care. They wanted everything done for this patient. And so we had to spend a lot of time talking with family members and getting, you know, get, hearing what each one wanted and what their needs were in the situation so that they could at some point come to a consensus on how they proceeded with the care of their patient who the doctor was convinced wasn't going to make it out of the ICU. So it was an interesting experience and one that has been repeated throughout my practice over and over again. Thank you, Erlen. So my first experience was a new paramedic student who was doing their ride-alongs with us. We went to a 77-year-old female at a nursing home, and they handed us this form. And the first lead provider looked at it, hands it to the next one, and then they all turned around and looked at me and went, well, you're the educator. Like, what is a pulsed form? It says no to this, no to that. And the student goes, you guys don't know what that is. They taught us in class. And we're like, well, what is it? And he says, it's just like the DNR, because that's what we were looking for, was to not resuscitate this patient. He says, it's the same thing. It just goes further. So that I did my research realizing that we got to teach the current providers what the new providers are learning, because we had no idea that this form even existed, what it was, what it had to do with. And back then, it was only for facilities. It wasn't going into people's homes like it is now, which is awesome. But I educated myself on it, and it became like my mission to make sure that this form is everywhere and that we as EMS providers know what it is and what it does for us. Because it actually allows us to then not focus on the individual who's in cardiac arrest, but the individuals who are there, the loved ones, the care providers at the nursing home, where we can provide compassion and empathy towards them and talk to them and actually have conversations about what is going on because that's when we come into the scene is to actually provide that over the resuscitation. Thanks, Jack. So I started in long-term care in 2011 and I think that was probably the first time I had encountered the pulse form. And I remember starting probably my first month, I was the first time I'd worked in healthcare and there was a patient who was terminally ill and um, had a pulse form that said to be full code, so all resuscitation um, and uh, all treatment provided. Uh, but they were going to be going on to hospice care, and family wanted them to continue to be full code even though likely they were going to pass in the next few few months. 
So I remember a nurse went up to me and said, oh, go, go talk to this family and this patient about changing their pulse form. And, you know, me not knowing hardly anything about the prognosis and, and everything, I awkwardly had a conversation with the family and the patient about wanting, if they wanted to change to be uh, a DNR and, um, you know, I think a lot of us have, it was an uncomfortable conversation, not knowing a lot. They asked a lot of medical questions that I wasn't able to understand. Um, but that was just the one of many conversations I had uh, with the poll, about the pulse form. So. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Troy. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here today on the panel. Um, I've been pretty lucky. I've been fortunate. I haven't had any personal experience with family members on a pulse form. I have had clients who I've been on the periphery and visited them in their home, and uh, they've had a pulse form there while they were on hospice. But my first involvement really was more on a policy level, and it was as part of sitting on the Commission on Aging. A few years back, we had a subcommittee, a steering committee for the ePulse project here in Utah, which is still proceeding, I think, gradually. And uh, hopefully we'll get there one day. But that was my first exposure to the pulse form and really trying to define and understand the difference between that and advanced directives. Of course, as an attorney, I've been involved with advanced directives for years and even the predecessor to advanced directives. So I think that's one thing that as educators and as um, providers, we can help the public understand is the distinction between those forms. And um, I th they're both very important, have their own place, but not interchangeable, so. So Troy, let me ask you to uh, just to segue into that. Let's talk a little bit more. There's a handout in the packet that kind of breaks out the comparison, for example, between the advanced care directive and uh, a pulse form. Would you, can you elaborate just a little bit more about maybe what some of those differences are? Would you like to start that conversation? Sure. Yeah, I think it's important to talk about maybe misconceptions because there's a lot of terminology that people confuse, such as DNR, um, living will, will, uh, advanced directives, and like Dr. Collette said, TV is not your reliable resource. Neither is Google, although you can find a lot of information out on that. Um, I have people call my office and say, you know, my parent died. We need a reading of the will. We, we don't do that. That's a TV thing. So <laughs> same, same thing with Pulse and with some of these other documents. I'm going to go out on a limb. I've learned, if one thing marriage has taught me is to not speak in absolutes. If I start a sentence <laughs> with you always or you never, it just goes downhill from there. But I'm going to go out on a limb here and take a risk and say, I, looking around the room here, I think everybody in this room should have an advanced directive. I also suspect that nobody in this room should have a pulse form. So think about that for a minute. The, the big distinction is a pulse form, there are three people who can direct your health care. Anyone want to guess who that is? Number one is yourself, if you're able to. Number two is your agent if you've made an advanced directive or a medical power of attorney and appointed somebody to do that. And number three is your doctor. And so two forms address those three possibilities. If you can speak for yourself, you don't need a form. But if you can't, then your first line of defense or help is an agent under an advanced directive or a medical power of attorney. The pulse form is a doctor's order. I used to think it stood for physician's order, but it's actually provider's order um, for life-sustaining treatment. And so that has to be signed by your physician after consulting with you. So it's still going to be your wishes, but if you're not able to consult with the physician, they can consult with your healthcare agent. So the, that's the distinction between those. Utah doesn't have a DNR. The DNR is another thing you see on TV. However, I suspect some states have that. Do not resuscitate. The closest thing we have here is the pulse form. And that's going to be for somebody that is under either a terminal illness or hospice or 
has a, a, an issue right now going on. I've had people ask me for DNRs before, and I've tried to explain and educate on what a pulse form is, and you just, it's not appropriate and it's not even legal for me to assist somebody to do that. You have a form in your packet that is the pulse form. It used to be on a blue sheet, and now I don't think it's required to be on a blue sheet, but that form, very specifically, it has to be that form. With an advanced directive, sometimes our law firm, we can change the format a little bit, we can add some text, we can put in client special instructions. On the post form, if there's not a space for it, you don't addend it, you don't change it, you don't change the font. The statute's very clear about that. It's gotta be in that format signed by a physician after consultation. Or when I say physician, I mean a nurse practitioner or a uh, physician assistant. So I think that's a big distinction between the two. I don't know if that covers the question fully. Yeah. Uh, Dr. I just Blatt. wanted to comment why many, when I give it to my patients, I tend to give it a, on a white piece of paper. Blue is what was designated uh, in Denver. It was a pink sheet. In other places, it's lime green or yellow. The problems with colored sheets of paper, they don't fax very well. And when you fax that sheet to the hospital, it turns kind of dark and black and no one can read it. So having it on a white piece of paper to be faxed is great if you want to have it on a blue paper or a different color on your refrigerator until we get it electronically available. Um, but that's, that was the reason bes bes uh, behind the color. Great. It, you, you both have mentioned the electronic version of the Pulse. Just, for just a moment, since this has been a project we've been working on for a lot of years <laughs> that you're chairing right now, talk a little bit about what the future goal is for the ePulse registry. For the state of Utah, we have the Utah Health Information Network, which is a uh, cloud-based type uh, medical record system that, that all hospital systems in the state of Utah can actually send their things. All clinics can actually send information up. It is still in, in an early stage. We're trying to get these forms coordinated, having people aware of it. But then once it's up there, how do you access it? You need to have a username and password so that the EMS can access it, but your cousin can't. It's very important to protect that information. Um, so we are in that stage of, of getting it. Uh, we, we had funding back in 2013. It was up and running. And then the uh, grant ran out. And so the pulse died, <laughs> which is a sad thing to that, say. That's kind of Keep metaphorical. Point. Yes. So, but um, we Did are- Did the pulse have a pulse? Yeah, we're resuscitating it. Yeah. So um, uh, luckily, pieces of paper don't have blood and stuff. We can actually revitalize it, uh, re go through it, and then re-educate people because uh, about the whole uh, electronic access. And then ideally, I see in the future, I mean, the, why I'm on the National Pulse Committee, uh, is to try to get nationally this recognized, and also it would be nice to have one universal form. Because having a different form for every state is just insane. But enough of that. We'll come back to jurisdiction in just a moment. That's a great point. When, so go ahead, please. I was just going to say one point on that. I think the e-pulse, when it, when it comes, is going to be really important because as an emergency medical service provider, if you have an incident and EMS shows up, they're going to resuscitate you unless, it doesn't matter if you have a living will, uh, if you have a power of attorney, and medical power of attorney, and that agent is standing there saying do nothing, they will still, they will still give you first aid and, and render aid. So the e-pulse is really the only avenue available, unless you've got one sitting there with you, strapped to your chest, and the EMS respondent is familiar enough with it, because they're just going through their protocol, as I understand it. So if they're familiar enough with that form and they see it right there, like if you're on hospice or something, then you stand a chance. But the e-pulse form will be very important. What we've done in our office is kind of a stopgap, and it doesn't address that issue directly. But when we complete for clients the advanced directives, HIPAA authorizations, agent power of attorneys, and so forth, we'll put it in a cloud-based service. There's a few around the country and they issue a little ID card, a wallet card, and that lets hospitals or providers download your power of attorney form, your living will, and so forth, 
And that's helpful when you check into a hospital. They're always going to ask you if you have advanced directives. And they, if you don't, they hand you the form from Utah Medical Association say, fill this out. Well, you're in a crisis situation, typically. And so if you've already had one filled out, our practice is to send a copy with the doc to the doctor to put in the chart and to issue this card to the, pay to the client as well. But we don't have a post form. We're not completing a post form for our clients. So that's not going to be there. First aid is still going to be rendered by the EMS provider when they arrive. And it's not going to be until later when they get to the hospital that they can download these forms and contact their emergency contacts and so forth and then get further direction. So just a little more background there. Jack, weigh so, in on that. So to address that elephant in the room <laughs> of what is EMS going to do, uh, Dr. Scott Youngquist, myself, Dr. Kim Rowland, and Dr. Brent Maybe, who all are medical directors in the Salt Lake Valley, we've actually shifted the Salt Lake County protocol, and every jurisdiction and everywhere in EMS is different, but with what you were saying earlier about what do they need, we actually teach our guys, what do you choose in the moment? <clears throat> because we allow family members on scene to make a choice. You are always at choice, and we will honor that choice in that moment to resuscitate or not because there's no way for us to access legitimate pulse forms or DNRs and all that stuff. And we've been doing it for four years to where we tell our guys, if a family member is seen and the patient is in cardiac arrest and they're saying, they, we don't want you to resuscitate them, they have discretion if it's obviously like a 27-year-old versus a 65-year-old, like the provider has the discretion to say like, no, we're gonna resuscitate. But we get a history and we use a number of information that you provide us to actually make a choice in that moment of whether resuscitation is gonna occur because we see this huge gap of information and it's not fair that we resuscitate someone because Dr. Youngquist and I have done cardiac arrest research together for six years and we presented it and we know that there are certain people we can resuscitate and certain ones we don't or not able to, and those are the ones that we focus on. Let them be, but the ones we can resuscitate, we're going to do it, and we're going to resuscitate them. And our numbers are actually the polar opposite of what Cami presented. In Salt Lake City, their cardiac arrest survival rate is in 66%. We're only like 7% below Seattle. And this is not, they have a pulse back, this is, a category one or two neurological status like their living life or living life with certain disabilities, but they can still function. So that's the big elephant in the room that I wanna, but it's knowing what your providers can in the area and as those that are doing the planning is promoting EMS to actually have a protocol like that until we can get pulse forms. Cause right now the pulse as we've talked about is just about those with terminal illnesses it doesn't address those that have chronic illnesses that aren't terminal. In time they will be, but those are the people that they're not gonna have a pulse or anything. So it's still choice in giving the providers on scene that ability to make a choice with the family and allowing the family to make a choice. Because I teach our people or my people to actually provide compassion and empathy to the care providers, not the patient. Because that's what we're truly there for is for you guys who are dealing with this traumatic situation to make it less traumatic. Thanks, Jack. Jennifer. Can I ask Jack a question? Please. <laughs> okay. Um, well, he mentioned that you've trained to, that if families are around, they can make decisions. What happens if family, if they have a pulse form that is DNR and family is around and there's a crisis and they say, no, I want you to resuscitate them? what would happen? So a discussion occurs, but we have to, as Troy pointed out, we have to follow what's legal and what's binding. And for us to violate a legal document doesn't serve us. But as a compliance officer, I deal with legal issues every day and always 100% commit to my employees that I have your back based on your choice. So if they chose to violate it, I'm actually gonna protect them. Even if it legally wasn't correct, we'll see what the results are and we'll deal with them. Because to have a huge drawn out battle on scene doesn't serve anybody. 
it doesn't serve. So that's where we go with it. Try. So I, I think what you said is if there's a post form there, you'll follow that directive. What if there's no documents? How, and you've got family members saying, let them go. <clears throat> How do you establish the legal authority there? Because um, I have some clients come in where they're very specific about which children they want to make decisions and which ones they don't. Or no children are to make a decision. They have a friend that understands their wishes. And so how do, you, how do your guys, your, your people, establish that authority? So they're going with what's present in the moment, in the moment that is there. So if, if there was legal things and documents and all that stuff, like they're just going to go with what, who is present, and they're going to make a judgment call based on that in that moment. And they're going to, somebody's going to be assessing the patient, figuring out history and all that stuff. And I'd say the majority of providers will, will go with the history of the patient and weigh that versus the desire of the family in the moment. And they are trained to evaluate their emotional state at the time because I, I've been trained and I know a number of people have been trained on when the emotional side of your brain kicks in, you're only feeling, you're not rationalizing anything. That part of your brain, there's numerous studies that have shown that the rational side of your brain is off. It's 100% off. It's only the emotional side of your brain, which is all just feeling. And so they weigh the emotional state of the individuals that are there as to what decision they're going to make. And it's never the same. Yeah. Do they have access to the history, the chart in the um, moment there? Typically, the majority in advanced care planning, that's something I'd add, is, is to document your history. Write it down. These are my medications. These are my histories. These are my allergies. And have that on your refrigerator because that's the three big questions we're going to ask you. And if you don't want to repeat it seven times to the different providers you're going to encounter from EMS all the way through the hospital, have it on a piece of paper where it just goes from person to person to person. And that paper, I've seen that paper follow a patient from an EMS 911 scene all the way to a nursing home because they just kept passing the paper along of here's their, here's the information we know you're going to ask. So we don't even have to ask the questions because it's written down. So that's one of the biggest pieces of information we need because that's where we make a lot of decisions from. Things. So medical history, allergies, and medications. We don't need doses. We don't need how many times a day. We just need the name. That's great information. Thank you. I want to ask um, Irene if she would touch a little bit on, we, we've talked about the importance of you come across a circumstance where, in Jack's case, you're on, on scene, and now you've got to make some tough decisions, and you've got to go with information that's available. I think everybody's pointed out, Cammy Troy in particular, about the critical nature of having these things prepared ahead of time, and so that's why these sample forms have been put in the packet. They're available online through a variety of sources, including the Commission on Aging. But Irene, in your circumstance, talk a little bit, if you can, about how you counsel through those, those conversations where people have to make a choice and, and, and what kinds of things you've encountered that, that can be a challenge in sorting that out. Thank you, appreciate that opportunity. I would also add to that sheet that he's talked about whether or not there is an advanced directive, what if they have expressed their wishes or not. Um, many, many times um, I remember a situation where a woman came into, uh, well, uh, the, patient, the man was the patient. He was an older man. Um, he came in to the hospital. He, um, they, they had him intubated by the time I got to the emergency room. And one of my first questions is to, to his wife is, is this what he'd want? And she says, what do you mean? And I said, well, has he completed an advanced directive? She says, oh, yes, he has an advanced directive. He didn't want any of this. He was already intubated. He had already been resuscitated. And I said, do you have that, do you have that paperwork with you? And she said, oh, no, I have no idea where it is. And that's the, that's the saddest thing. I mean, she had, they had had the discussion. The, the worst, an, a worse situation I had was I, I was in an emergency room with a woman. Again, the, the gentleman was the patient, and I said, does he want this? And she said, I don't know. We've never talked about it. That's the, that's the saddest thing to me is they'd lived together 60 years, and they'd never talked about how they wanted the end of their life to go. So the important thing is to have the discussion, document it, advance directive, Pulsed if you're in a chronic condition that you need that. But um, 
but definitely just start the discussion with your family. Start and and if it if it is something that you have strong feelings about, make sure it's on your refrigerator. It's by your bed, and and when EMS is called, make sure they 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 receive it and they ask. You know, they if they whether they ask or not, make sure they know that you have made that decision. Thank you for that. I want to engage Jennifer in this too. Um, you know, clearly. There are a lot of people who put off really critical conversations. I've experienced, I'm not there yet for myself, but experience going through parents is it's time to stop driving. It's time to get a, a medical provider's opinion on this. How do we take away the keys? How do we have conversations about, uh, can I age in place or do I need to go to another facility? And look, as we get older, we get a little bit um, tough to deal with on occasion. <laughs> so how have you managed difficult family situations about just even encouraging the conversation and maybe talk through some of your experience of how you manage that. So I'll just share kind of what the current practice is in nursing homes. So when a patient is admitted to a nursing home, a nurse, generally it's uh, the intake nurse, will hand them a pulse form. Um, and about 20 other pages as well of getting hit, you know, assessments and history and everything. So it's one form, a part of the whole admission packet. So the current practice I don't feel like is sufficient. It probably, mostly the nurse hands them or the family a pulse form and says, okay, do you want to be DNR or, CP, or do you want CPR? And that's about it. You know, there's no discussion about uh, what, you know, what their goals of care are. Um, it's just brushed over kind of, that, that's generally what's practiced. So um, what's important is that that, so most patients in a nursing home do have a pulse form, but I, I, I think the discussion needs to not end on admission to a nursing home. It needs to be reviewed often. And uh, so how to encourage those conversations can be, um, it, it can be difficult. Usually they rely on the social worker at the nursing homes to kind of have those second or third conversations. And I mean, not all of us are great at having those discussions. Uh, I think it's important to, to ask, though, like, do you want this? Sometimes we never even ask that. Do you want to go back to the hospital, you know, if something happens? Sometimes reframing the pulse questions, uh, I mean, I think there is a lot of misconceptions about, some, especially with the media, how they portray it, uh, or TV. Uh, but really, essentially, if you have stopped breathing and you don't have a pulse, you have passed away, you know, you are dead. So just reframing it in that way sometimes changes their way of like, oh, so I have died. Do you want to try... It's, it's an explaining kind of what that looks like um, because it is really terrible to have, you know, these frail 90-year-old patients be re try to be resuscitated. It's very, very um, brutal. So uh, just trying to have uh, answer a, a little bit more questions ask questions about uh, what their understanding of it is, um, maybe, and then educate about some of the misconceptions about the pulse, so. Consequences of either choice, right? I really, do you have some more thoughts on that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that in, in our hospitals, when, when patients are moved from the emergency room or to ICU or to med surge or something, or from surgery, to the, the floor where they're, where they're uh, gonna recover for a few days. The nurses ask, as part of the screening, do you have an advanced directive 
do you want more information about it? But I know from the number of referrals that I get that people either aren't understanding that question or they're answering it wrong because they're given an opportunity, at least I know in our hospital, probably most hospitals, when you move from, from floor to floor, from nurse to nurse, you get the opportunity to say, oh, what's an advanced directive? And so then they have the opportunity to give us a referral so that we can come and just have the conversation with us, with them about what it is. And that we love getting those referrals because then we get a chance to go in and talk to them about the advanced directive or in some cases the POLTS, whatever the situa their situation is. And we, um, we get a chance to give them an awareness of what those things are at the bedside when they have the opportunity to you know, they're in a health crisis or at least a health situation where they need to be considering what they really want. So I think you bring up a really important point. I think uh, earlier, Troy mentioned, and it's the theme of everybody here, is uh, if your voice can be heard, you obviously, you're the one who should be making the decisions for your own situation. And I think as people, as I suggested, the example of taking keys away from a driver if you can get to the point where they think it's a good idea to do it, and it's their decision, that they have some control in that decision, that's really important. But you talk about a circumstance now where we're trying to educate people when, they've, when they're transferring from one unit to another, they're just coming out of surgery. I can think of even in discharge situations, something that Dr. Farrell works on a great deal, is the, not only just the adult literacy of understanding something and health, uh, care, but it's also are we able to process things when we're just coming out of anesthesia or we're coming out of a situation? So how would you advise that kind of an interaction so that if people are being asked to consider something, that there is the ability to determine whether they understand what it is they're being asked to decide or if they have appropriate advocates at their side to help talk things through? Just Open that up. Go yeah, ahead. that's a really great question, and I think that I think the answer to that is is a lot of discussion. I think the discussion has to start with the you know whoever introduced it. In my situation, it'd be the chaplain. We come in and we explain what the advanced directive is. We explain the decisions that they have to make. That you know whether or not they want to name an agent, what their family situation is, you know pl plays into that. Um, whether or not they want CPR, those kinds of things. So. We start the conversation, and then we encourage them always to have this conversation with your family, because people often don't know, or or they, you know, they they're a little bit ambiguous. Do I? I don't know. Do I want CPR? Do I? I don't. I don't know. And then they don't really understand what being intubated means when they're not in that situation. So we really have to talk to them a lot more. So we as chaplains talk about it, they, they talk with their family about it, and then I think more of the discussion has to come from the physician. The physician has to explain if they're in a chronic health situation, they've got some kind of illness that will ultimately lead to their death, they probably ought to lay out what they're really looking at so that they, they can make an informed decision about each stage of what that illness is going to be for them. So if, they, if we talk to them and if they talk together as a family and the physician talks to them, um, maybe it will come to the point where they want a pulsed form. Maybe the advanced directive is enough. But they really do need to have the discussion over time. There needs to be a lot of discussion. They need to have their questions answered. They need to spend time really considering, do I want CPR? It, it is, and I often say it's not like it's on, it is on TV. It's, that's not your, gonna be your experience of it. And, and people just don't even comprehend the intubation or getting to the port, port where, part where they need feeding, you know, tube feeding. So we just need, to, we just need more discussion. Right. I know that um, Jack talks a little bit about the challenges of coming into a crisis situation, and, and it, it's a difficult time to make an objective decision at that point. So, could any of you want to comment about, um, uh, we, we look at this from the standpoint of the individual and, and how that impacts them, but it also impacts family members and caregivers when decisions aren't made. It puts them in, in a difficult situation or at odds, and trying to convince people to take the time to do their advanced directives is, is not only thinking about themselves, but thinking about the others that it impacts in their lives. And if you have something you'd like to share about how you help them understand the importance of how this impacts other people when you choose to do nothing. I would say that's a great segue to have the care providers that are out here ask questions. 
Okay, that absolutely. Are more specific than. Do, do we have some questions, anybody? Yes, well, we've got several. Let's start right here, and then we'll go back. Right here at first and front here. Thank you. Um, Jack, this question is for you. What, um, I am someone who very adamantly does not want to be resuscitated, and I have all my documents. But it, if I am in a car accident, and I'm alone and unconscious, what will happen when someone comes? Well, you know, I've got stuff in my phone. I've got a bracelet on. Will anybody pay any attention to that? So if you have something that identifies like the DNR bracelet or other types of bracelets that says advanced directives and directs us to where they are, we won't resuscitate you. Okay. And trauma kind of trumps. We In Utah, we're taking a different stance on trauma as that those patients need a surgeon. We know that. And unless we can get you to the hospital in less than 10 minutes, you're most likely, we're gonna, you're gonna see a decrease in resuscitations on scene of trauma in specific types of trauma because we know that it's just, it's more traumatizing to the family, the medical bills, all that stuff that comes afterwards. We've realized as physicians and as EMS providers that even though we're doing this service, we're here to serve, that it doesn't serve the individual because we know that your injuries are too severe. But if you're in a car, and passed out, things like that. It's what we have on scene is what we have to go on. So you, you may be resuscitated. But what I'm asking, I mean, like we tell people like, list your emergency contacts, ICE in your phone. Do you guys ever look at that? We do. Okay. <laughs> Especially if you're alone and you're unconscious, like we need to, we need to figure out who you are because yeah. that's where okay. all the knowledge And those is. of you working on policy, I want to say almost everyone is carrying one of these. So if we can figure out a way to have this be something we all look at, that'd be great. So how do you manage that with the password? You just take their thumb and put it on the phone and I'm with, kidding. Quarter, with most but, phones, we don't have to. Yeah. There's the emergency section that has the history. Autom automatically comes up. Automatically yeah. we can bypass passwords. Did you have a comment on that, Cami? Yes, yeah. I just want to say, if you were in an accident and still breathing and in agony, you would want them to at least get you some comfort into the hospital. So that's, that's the difference. I think that the pulsed, when it says do it, DNR, that truly means my heart is stopped, I am not breathing, I am dead. So I think that people, many people are not afraid of being dead. They are afraid of the dying and the pain and the agony. And so this is the difference. And I think that if people are in agony, we do need to, to. Because I, I had a, um, my mom's cousin at 96 had a stroke and she was in a rehab facility. And I called to see how she was doing. I heard this screaming in the background. And, and, it's, and I said, what, who, who is screaming back there? She says, oh, yeah, mom, she's a little constipated. <laughs> that's not the scream of constipation. That's a scream. I have no blood supply to my bowel. I think she's had a stroke to her bowel. She had a stroke, and now she's got a stroke to her Her bowel doesn't have any circuit. She's in agony. Get her to the hospital. And her, his, the son said, but she's DNR. I said, Albert, that doesn't mean do not treat. She cannot get IV Dilaudid at that rehab center. Get her to the hospital. Your mother's probably dying, but please get her comfort. Your mom wants to be comforted. So they did take her to the hospital, and by the morning she had died, and she did have ischemic bowel. So I think that we do have to recognize that our medical system can provide comfort. We are not about sitting there and says, oh, DNR will just wait maybe five more minutes. I don't know. I mean, we need to comfort and always make sure people are not in pain and not in agony. That's a really valid point. Jack, follow up? And to follow up what Cammie's saying is EMS has comfort care protocols. I wrote them, at least in the Salt Lake Valley, and they've been adopted statewide, to where we will shift from resuscitation to, okay, they're not, they're almost there, but we'll provide CPAP and provide opiates if needed for comfort that may not be available from the hospice nurse that may have stepped out for the moment and that's why we got called. Like We've built in fail safes to make sure people are comfortable versus just going like, well, there's nothing we can do because the DNR. We know that DNR means they have to be dead. It's nothing beyond before that. Thank you for there was a time every time I went to the hospital or to the doctor's office or to an Instacare, they said, do you have your form? 
well, I filled one. No. So they give you one, fill it out. Sometimes you had to fill it out before you got treated. I mean, it was serious business. What if there are two different forms, an advanced uh, health care directive and the post form, and one of them may be older than the other? Which one would take precedent? I, let me speak to that. First of all, everyone needs an advanced directive. An advanced directive designates who can legally speak for you. So that is a separate form entirely. The pulse form is a medical order that is in current time frame. So if it says, I do not want to, if my heart is stopped and I'm not breathing, this is actually a medical order. If it says, I, if I need a feeding tube to prolong my life, I do not want a feeding tube. It goes into much more detail about what, and it's a medical order. But the pulse form does not designate who is your family members who can make decisions for you. Um, it, the pulse form does have a box that says, this is, I want this followed as a guideline, but I want my family the freedom to change it. And I have to admit, the nicest thing my mother ever did was not give me the freedom to change it, because that freed me to allow her to be in comfort. So uh, they are both important, but the pulse form is only for someone who, if I look down my list of patients I'm gonna see today, and I say, would I be surprised if this patient died in the next year? Well, I'd be totally surprised. Well, then they don't need a pulse. But I have patients, I look down the list, and I said, three of my patients today could easily die in the next year. I need to get a pulse form on them now. And the annual wellness visit for Medicare is the beautiful time to do that. Every year, you're going in for an annual wellness. Every year, you can review it with your doctor and, and establish your advanced directive who says, OK, who do I call when you're sick and, and unconscious, or maybe with dementia? And now, who I can talk with? And then the pulse form is, can be filled out by that, that healthcare proxy. Whereas the advanced directive, if you didn't have it, I have to rely on who the legal system says is the next person I go to, even though you may not want your oldest child making the decisions. Uh, and you can maybe speak to that exactly. When you don't have an advanced directive, who are they gonna call? Is it gonna be the girlfriend that's lived with you for 17 years, or is it gonna be their brother? Uh, and it's not the girlfriend, because she hasn't gotten a leak unless it's on the form. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good question that you ask. I think it'll help if we dissect the advanced directive a little bit. Um, Ten plus years ago in Utah, there were two forms. One was a medical power of attorney, and one was a living will. What the advanced directive has done is combine those two forms. And so if you look on the sample that was passed out in your folder, you'll see there's a part one and a part two. And the reason it's important to distinguish those is because part one, which is the power of attorney part, is really you appointing another person to make decisions for you. Part two, the living will portion, is you making your own decision with a witness as to what you want. And so that goes back to the conversation earlier about how do you relieve a family member of that burden? Now, one of the choices on that form is, I don't want to decide, or I want to let my agent decide. So you can throw it back to your agent if you want. But most people, in my experience, have some pretty strong feelings about whether or not they want intervention or they want life-sustaining treatment to keep them alive if they would otherwise pass away naturally. So because there's the two separate forms, you, you need to think about it as two separate situations. They're both advanced directives, but one is if you're in a car accident and you can't make a decision, be informed consent, for example, because you, you're on pain meds and they're treating you, you're not terminal, you need to have somebody else authorize the surgery. That's going to be your, your agent who you designate. Part two probably doesn't come into that at that time if you're not terminal. Um, but in the situation where you are terminal, Part two expresses your wishes. So now you're not putting that on somebody else. Legally, if you also have a pulse form, so this would be somebody in a long-term care facility or a nursing home, the pulse form, if it was completed by, by you, the patient, that will override and have precedence over your living will because that was done with a physician and it's signed by a physician or medical professional. And so if you've got a conflict between your living will saying one thing and the post form saying another thing, the post form, because remember that was done now in, in the current 
urgent situation, the current acute situation of your medical condition, whereas the advanced directive may have been done a year ago, five years ago, the post form is more contemporaneous. It's, it's your current situation. So that'll take precedence legally. If a post form was signed by an agent, which is authorized if you can't sign it by yourself, it still has to be done with a physician. But if a physician can't consult with you because of your condition or your capacity, they can consult with an agent and then complete the post form. I suppose a, an agent could subsequently change that post form with cons consulting with the physician and update it. But again, that's going to take priority over your living will if that agent was appointed under your healthcare directive, if that makes sense. Thank you for that. Let me just ask the panel now, there are uh, kind of a, a, another angle to look at this. People travel when they're older and we have jurisdictional issues, specifically with advanced directives. Talk a little bit about any of you um, in terms of, of how uh, the reciprocal understanding of advanced directives were state to state. It's managed and uh, uh, administrated by a state um, uh, statutes. And, and what happens when somebody goes to another state and they have a situation where their advanced directive comes into play? Or how do we treat somebody coming in the state of Utah? Well, I'll speak from the EMS perspective. The Department of Health's uh, medical director over all EMS has stated to us that we are to accept any advanced directive or post form or DNR from another state because Utah is a big area of travel and I pose the question, what about international? Because Utah is a huge, huge location for international travel as well. And he's like, an advanced directive, a living will, a pulse form, or any sort of DNR is their wishes. It's been stated, so do what's right and follow it. So that's the EMS perspective, is we're gonna honor it because that's the choice that was made. That is wonderful for the state of Utah. Um, South Dakota just barely got a pulse form and most of their providers don't know it. So if you are traveling out of state, that doesn't guarantee the other states would honor it. If you're aboard a cruise ship and you're out in some area and they have a doctor aboard the cruise ship, if they don't, you, you, it's nice to take your directive. I don't know on the cruise ship what their policies are, but I'll tell you, cruise ships hate it when they die on their cruise. So they are gonna try to do everything in their power to get you off that cruise ship and to a facility. Whether you're in Costa Rica or Guatemala, they're gonna get, they're gonna get you off. Um, it's just, that's one of the things that seems to happen. Well, I'll share that. Currently, my mother-in-law and her husband, who's had prostate cancer for six years now, was supposed to die four years ago, they go on these long cruises. They're currently in the Pacific Ocean going to Japan from Alaska. And they have it with them and they're very upfront with the crews and they have been doing this for the last three years, twice a year. And they've, the cruise line that they use, I said, no, boy, we will honor it. But they, I told them, I said, you need to be upfront. Like there's one of these cruises, Arthur's gonna pass away. Like it's, it's gonna happen. I, I feel it, I know it, my wife knows it. And so from day one of their, their, year-long cruises that they go on and things like that. It's like they were open and honest and had the conversation asked, what would you do if this happened? And the cruise lines were actually, started actually asking from what I've heard, not all, but if you bring it up, it's a conversation to have when you travel is, is this what I need and take it with you because you never know what's gonna happen, so. I'm glad you brought that up because we just had the conversation two weeks ago. Yes, I, uh, when my mom turned 80, we did a cruise through the Panama Canal. First thing I visited with my mom was the doctor facility to check it out. Uh, it was a, a Bolivian physician who did speak English, but you know it's just nice to know who was there. Um, I ran into a lovely couple that they were going all the way through the Panama Canal, and when we hit Miami, they were coming back. And I said, it's the same trip. And... <laughs> you haven't gotten off at any port, you just play bridge. And, and they said, oh, well this is cheaper than a nursing home and it's much more fun because we get new people coming in. 
And, um, and the food is so much better. And we get entertainment with, I mean, it's just cheaper than a nursing home for this folks, for them. For, and that's just what they did. And we did have one lady die. Um, and uh, we, they, they life flighted her out, even though I think she officially died on board. She wasn't pronounced dead until she was in the Costa Rican thing, but they had to fly her body out, which is also costly. But um, you, so if you are doing this, I would highly recommend some sort of insurance to cover emergency evacuation. Um, but yeah, I'm amazed how many people do. I mean, what better way to go? I, I died on the cruise. I died, you know, that's, I died playing golf. Yeah, but don't resuscitate me at hole six. Uh, those are the things that I think are important. So for those of you uh, engaged in planning for uh, aging options, housing, be sure to include perpetual cruising. <laughs> that's, that's actually pretty creative. Yeah, in fact, uh, Rob, you were saying uh, it, trying to tell someone when you need to transition them. So my mother, she had a little stroke at 89. She was driving her car, very full functional, taking her little Pomeranian to the old folks' home to visit the old people who were in their 70s. And um, she had this small stroke, so um, she couldn't drive her car anymore. We had to transition her into you know, assisted living. And I said, Mom, remember that cruise on the Panama Canal? We're gonna, you're going to be living on board a place just like that, but it's not moving. Because this is a really nice, and it's $6,400 a month. These places are not cheap if you want a really nice cruise ship that doesn't move that's an assisted living place. So my mom says, OK. So then I said, but you know you can't drive. She says, honey, I'm ready to be chauffeured. That's fine. I like being chauffeured. And so it's, it's all in your attitude. How do you phrase it? And I do remember a gentleman who came in. He had, his car wouldn't start. He called AAA, and they got it started. And they said, now, sir, you need to drive it around for a while. So he did. He drove it around, drove it around, and he couldn't find his way back. So unfortunately, he's driving, and he hits a light pole, totals the car, hits his head, comes in through EMS to the hospital. He, they think he's had a serious head injury because he can't, he has, knows nothing. Well, he has dementia. So the police go to the house to tell the wife that he's in the hospital. And she says, no, he's here. He's in the bedroom. And she closes the door on him because she has dementia too. They have five kids, all live out of state. So the next day, the, the Relief Society president comes to the bedside. I'm there with the wife, the husband. I'm telling him he, he isn't going to be able to drive anymore. And he says, you can't take away my car. It's, I have a right to drive. And I said, well, actually, sir, you know, you actually hit a light pole last night, and you totaled your Cadillac. Um, so actually, you can't drive that car. But you know what? What if that pole, what was that light pole was a child? What, how would you feel? Now, even with his dementia, he got this scared look on his face. He looked at the Relief Society president, and he said, we need to rally the troops. We're going to need help. And I was so impressed that even a dementia patient knew that he shouldn't drive when put in the position of, what if that light pole was a child? We have to sometimes rephrase why certain people shouldn't drive. Thank you for that. Before we leave the issue of jurisdiction, I just wanted to make sure that it's clear, clear to me anyway. So while Utah agrees in principle to respect requests, whether they're from other states or internationally, is that reciprocal expectation in play for the other states of the country? Or is, do people need to think that through in terms of preparing if they're traveling to Arizona or anywhere else and have an incident? It's hard to talk to all the states about all the states, but in Utah, there's two conditions where we will respect an out-of-state directive. One is if it meets the requirements of Utah law, and two, in the either or, if, if it doesn't meet the U Utah law requirements for an advanced directive, as long as it meets the requirements, legal requirements of the state it was drafted in, then we'll also honor it. So under those two conditions, it covers pretty much all the states, presuming that they had it done properly. Um, I would imagine, under the Uniform Probate Code and the Uniform Codes, that many of the states are very similar, if not most of them. I think many did adopt, we were one of the early adopters, I believe, of the Advanced Directive, and several others patterned after our work. You talked about Pulse being something that we hope will have a standardized form across the country at some point as well. Let me just ask, check real quick, if other questions, uh, the audience? Yes, please. I would like to ask all of the panel um, if you would share any experiences you've had dealing with uh, family members from other 
um, cultures here and, and faith groups in this community where the whole process of death and dying may be vastly different from the one that we're very familiar with. So I would be interested in your comments on that. That's a great, great question. That segues into the next section. Nicely done. So I, um, we had a Navajo woman who only spoke Navajo at the hospital. All of her family were there. She was seriously ill. And I was trying to establish what her code status was. And I needed the family to go in the room to translate. Uh, and I, so I was telling the family members what I needed to ask her because she's a competent woman, even though she's elderly and frail, and she easily could, she, I really did expect her to die within the next year because she was very ill. But when I told the family members I needed to ask her that, they said, oh, no, you cannot go in front of grandma. You cannot talk about her death in front of her. This is a taboo in our culture. Please do not, you can't talk about the death in front of that person. And I said, well, how can I find out? Because if, if something happens, we're going to do all this stuff. Oh, no, 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 no. She wouldn't want that. She, and every single family member was in agreement that grandma would, you know, their mother, their mother, grandmother, aunt wouldn't want it, which was thankful. Um, so I said, okay, well, then we'll do, go ahead and put her as a do not resuscitate because if that bad thing happens, I do not want her to be tortured. And the family was happy with that. The young doctors I was instructing said, but she's a competent individual. You have to go in there. I mean, th this is against the law. You're going to get into trouble. <laughs> and I said, I'm being culturally sensitive here, so I'm going to honor this culture and honor this wish. And so, um, yes, and you do need to know. Uh, many family members, they, they do not like it. It's taboo to talk about the death. And so I had another Navajo, and I said, uh, well, actually, this was a, a go shoot. And I was talking to their family, because he had given me permission to talk to his family members. And I said, he's pretty ill, and, and I, I just didn't know how, what your family traditions are or what I need to know about your tribe, the go shoots. And they said, oh, well, we have a medicine man who wants, he, he can come up and do the smoke ceremony. And I said, oh, well, that's great. Um, is that in the room? Because he's on oxygen. <laughs> I didn't know. But no, it was a ceremony. They did it outside at, at St. Mark's Hospital. They came up. We honored the tradition. And uh, he actually remained full code because he was on dialysis and still wanted everything. But the family all knew that at some point he was going to die. He was a young uh, diabetic person who hadn't been taking care of, good care of himself. Um, and so... Um, and he had to come up from the tribal area to get his dialysis, and he would miss it. So when he would miss it, he'd end up in our hospital in horrible renal failure. And we'd always bring him back, but at some point they knew he was going to die. But So I think it's important, if we don't know, is to ask, is there anything I need to know about your family traditions, your cultural heritage, what I need to know? And boy, I learn a lot. And I, I think that's just another um, plug for communication, talking about it. The, making sure that your, the advanced directive, the PULSE, reflects the cultural specific or religious specific requests that people have. You just have to have the conversation and then formalize it in the, in the paperwork. It's, it's just vital to make sure that that happens. Back here, right? Uh, I worked with the patient for a few years and unfortunately it wasn't a, a a uh, happy ending to everything, but there was a patient, she was younger, um, had young children, I think was in her 40s, um, from uh, India, and had a brain injury. And she came in to the rehab center, intubated, and uh, had very, very little, um, was not, she was alert, but not oriented or couldn't communicate, needed a feeding tube. And um, I, there was family with her 24 hours a day. The whole family had adjusted their brothers, parents, had all changed their life to really be around her, and, not, and she was never alone. Uh, but after two years of, uh, you know, very little progress, the husband decided to withdraw support. And it was hard because all the family had changed their life, and this was really, the, this um, is what they were doing, and they didn't all agree, but because the husband was the one that had, uh, you know, 
I don't think there was an advance directive, but due to law, the husband was the one that could make that decision. So he chose to withdraw treatment, and there was some family rifts and a lot of, you know, conflict, but um, that's what ended up happening. So it's good to be able to talk about these things before anything ever because a lot of times, once you get to a rehab facility, the, it's too late to have made these discussions. So. Thank you for that. So, uh, Representative Chavez, how talked a little bit about the movie, Farewell, and, and, and it focuses on, obviously, a cultural approach to protecting grandma from something they knew about her that they weren't sure she did, and, and the whole scenario of, of a gathering of a family under the pretense of something else. I won't give away all the plot. Um, so that so that the grandmother wouldn't have to address you know some of the issues regarding her health, and uh, it was a fascinating exercise to, and, and a lot of great portrayals of that. There are uh, in the training for cultural competence, it, it pre and, and I'm probably preaching to the choir with this, but we've often heard growing up in in our culture the idea of the golden rule, and the golden rule says do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And what that really is, that's a frame from our perspective. That's like saying, I'm going to do for you what I'd like done for me. And that just doesn't really apply. In the cultural competence, it's called the platinum rule. It is you do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Where you really try to understand where they're coming from, what their perspective is, what is their frame, and meet them there rather than using your standard. And I think that's just a, a constant challenge. Jack, any comment on that? So your question and your statement are exactly where I would choose to go is with cultural competency, if it makes you uncomfortable, then lean into it because you're going to learn about that culture by the experience. The number of experiences that I could tell stories about for hours on of smudging ceremonies and different Jewish ceremonies and different Muslim ceremonies that I've gotten to participate in because I was open to saying, okay, well, we're open to it. We agree that this person's going to die, and they enroll us in participating in it in drum ceremonies and flutes. It's like, it was awesome. I learned so much more to be able to teach others about culture by experiencing the culture versus reading in a book saying, this is what you may or may not experience with these different cultures is I've once experienced this culture and this culture and this culture like the smokes the smudging ceremonies it's like i do it now with my family because i've learned about that culture and what it does and it works for my family and we do it at different times when people are sick because it works and i wouldn't ever have had that experience if i wasn't open on a scene when somebody was dying to experience it for myself that's wild jack thank you for that that's awesome any, any experiences from the group where you've encountered a cultural uh, challenge that you'd like to share and, and how you worked it through? I told you I was preaching the choir. We have a culturally competent group out here. That's great. Just a couple of things to wrap up the panel. I want to just do kind of a, a lightning round answer here. Two things. Um, one, if you were to identify a major barrier to effective application of these tools, how would you identify that? Maybe in a sentence or two, just uh, what would you consider to be a barrier that we have to overcome to get to a better place on how we manage these things? Who'd like to start? Troy? I think it's gotta be education. I mean, 20 years ago, if I had talked to my parents about advanced directives, well, I did. Their response was, you know, if I get there, just take me out behind the barn and shoot me. <laughs> and uh, that, that was not uncommon. I mean, he, obviously tongue-in-cheek, but I just couldn't get him to talk about it. Now they're more willing to talk about it, uh, maybe because the new barn and shoot me is go on a cruise. But we can have those conversations now and get those documents in place. So I think it, it, it happens over time as people age. But I think education, because even when I'm filling those forms out in the office, with the different choices, I'll have people come in and they've checked all the choices, and w then we talk about it. And I was talking to Dr. Farrell earlier about uh, those choices, and using an example of ALS, 
you can select a sequence of those choices in ALS's terminal, and yet it would require you to render life support because it doesn't narrowly fit that definition. Um, so I don't know. I, I think education, and I think I think the other thing is talking to your medical providers, not just the attorney, because we don't we can't explain things in medical terms like physicians can. And I think physicians could be more proactive as clients age, as their patients age, and likely they are, but you know they're caught between this, I, I suspect, between this um, productivity, you know, how many patients can they get through because the demands are so high, and yet spending the time that's required for patients to really understand their options and the outcomes and the consequences. Cool. Thanks, Troy. Jennifer. Uh, I think uh, one barrier is avoidance of the uncomfortable. So um, sometimes we avoid it too long where it's too late to have made our wishes known. So just lean into that uncomfortable. As a social worker, I probably wouldn't have gone into social work if I was not. I didn't like having those uncomfortable conversations. And... Uh, it only gets easier as we talk more and more about it, so lean in. Thank you. Jack. So the, the EMS barrier that I see is the duplication of work that happens, which is also an avoidance of the conversation that happens, because I've taken patients from hospitals to nursing homes, and as Jennifer pointed out, in their admission packet, there's another post form that they fill out for that facility. When one's already been filled out, and now you have conflicting forms that show up when we respond of, I've been handed a form, or I should say, I've had a crew been handed a form, and they started to follow it, and then we're quickly told, like, oh, wait, no, 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 that was the hospitals, let me go get ours. And it was like, why do you have two? <laughs> if a physician signed it at the hospital, then you have a post form. Leave it alone. And to piggyback on um, what Troy said too, um, not only education, but you have to talk about it a lot. I mean, when you first start talking about it, um, the patient isn't gonna know what they want. That's a huge barrier, is they have to decide. They have to take, you have to talk about it enough, educate enough, that they actually can make a decision about what they want, whether they want CPR, whether they wanna be intubated. Um, and another, uh, and then the family also has to come on board with it too. So there has to be enough discussion, enough education, talking with the doctors, talking with the lawyers, making sure that everybody kind of, um, I don't think these decisions are ever made early enough. It's definitely not, almost always with the pulsed, you know, it's, it's to the point where, you know, the patient, way too often they, they, we do the pulsed form. Uh, preparing him to go to a facility and then the patient passes away in the hospital. I think that, you know, that's that's a challenge, that's a hardship. So more talking earlier and talking until everybody's questions and concerns are, are answered. The other, and again, the other hardship is that having the paperwork available, either the advanced directive or the pulse, the you know, keeping copies of those everywhere, making, you know, electronic registry will be great. Um, but I don't know if the, if the advanced directive will be in that registry as well. But we need we need to have those the actual documents available when life saving decisions need to be made. Thank you. So I think the system, the whole uh, medical healthcare system for the United States, is an actually interesting barrier. Um, physicians. Um, they really don't want their patients to die. If they do, we get bad marks. We're measured by quality. Um, the, in patients, uh, they, what they, the system that they hear, you know, Barbara Bush goes on hospice, Barbara Bush dies. So hospice equals death. Um, my hospice murdered my family, my, my mother. Uh, so this systems of getting onto hospice, the United States says you have to have, uh, say, six months or less to live. And I even asked my mother's doctor in March uh, of the, uh, and she died three months later. I said, "Is, is she t ready for hospice?" And 
The doctor says, well, no, she looks pretty good. So we physicians, the, the, one, the better we know our patients, the worse we are at predicting prognosis. We really want our patients to live forever, too. So um, the next month, we got her on hospice, and she got at least two months of hospice. Um, and the other thing is, unfortunately, hospitals make more money the more they do. Um, when my, uh, my mom's cousin, who did die at 96 with a stroke, as I mentioned, she had a heart attack at 78. She was offered a bypass surgery. And she, they said, if you don't get this bypass surgery, you're going to die in the next year. And she just looked at him and said, well, that's a risk I'm going to have to take. But I'm not going to let you cut and she died at 96. But we doctors, we make more money by doing more things. And so one thing I think we as a system, just because we doctors can do something doesn't mean we should. And that's directly out of Atul Gawande's Being Mortal book. We need to reevaluate what's really best for the patient, not best for our pocketbook. And unfortunately, we make money on certain things. And I think the whole system needs to be revamped. So our incentive is to take care of the patient and not the bottom dollar. Thank you. I'm really glad you addressed that. You've talked about that before, and it's pretty compelling. Great stuff. I think we're going to wrap a little bit earlier. There's just one more thing I'm going to want the group to do. We'll get a little bit ahead of our schedule. I don't think anybody will, will worry about that. I just want to know if there's any other question that the audience is burning to ask that we haven't addressed. Yes? That's all right. Don't... I do have a question, and that is that... Um, we, when we go to the hospital or we go to the clinic, they can pull up on, our, say, I see patient, for instance. They could pull up, oh, are you still at this address? Yes. Oh, is this still correct? Yes, it is. But when they ask you if you have an advanced directive, they have to ask that. They don't have anything to say, oh, I see you have an advanced directive, so has that changed? No, they ask you again, and it gives the idea that it really isn't very important because they ask you every time. And I'm sure I have two on file at IHC. I'm pretty sure I have. Because if you go in for surgery, they want you to fill out another one. And so why does that happen? I mean, it's very confusing to me, and I can understand all of your saying up there that sometimes, you know, they change, and people have two, and... So what do you do I, with that? I believe there's a couple reasons why this happens. Um, first of all, the person who's asking the question may have a high school education, may not. They don't have permission to look into the medical record and see your information because they are not part of the healthcare system. They're actually checking you in. Um, so they can't see it. Sometimes they can't see it. Now, they should be able to see the box that says, but they don't know what it says. Um, plus, uh, you may have an advanced directive, it may be old. So we want to know if we have the most current advanced directive, which things can change. But what I have typically seen is they, is they say, do you have an advanced directive? And you say yes or no. And the next question is, and what is your insurance? <laughs> they, I mean, you have just said yes, and, and th they haven't asked, can we get it on file? Can we? Sometimes that question just stops, okay, we check the box I asked. So the, the, the script that most people, when you check into the hospital, they have, this is what you have to, you have to ask if they have an advanced directive, get their health insurance information, get, and so it's, 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 it's a system problem. Um, plus, you may have one at the University of Utah, but not at, IH, at but at IHC, and you're not at that facility. Um, it may be at your doctor's office, but not at this hospital because you're at Jordan uh, uh, Valley. So uh, the problem is the system because of the um, the person who knows can't sometimes have full access to be able to see that um, document, so they may not be able to look. Please. The one thing I would like to add is that the important, the really important thing about doing these, I think, is that we each, as we complete it for ourselves or we complete it for our loved ones, our parents who are elderly, there's going to be a level of peace of mind. You will have had a discussion that was meaningful, and they, they and you will have reached a, a peace of mind that is really important as we age and get to that point where those kind of difficult decisions are going to have to be made. So that's kind of what I see is the most important reason that we should do it is that we are having discussions and we all share the same level of peace of mind. Thank you for that. So I will just ask the panel now, is there anything that you're burning to share that you have not had an opportunity at this point? Pretty good? I actually want to share. We've all heard about universal health care 
let's get everybody covered. I would really like to have universal medical records if it were an ideal <laughs> world. It would save in the duplication, it would save in everything, but nobody's talking about that because there are so many companies making money off their individual electronic medical records. But if, in an ideal world, I not only want universal health care, universal dental care, oh, I have lots of wants, but I really would love to have universal medical information access and so that. Well said. So I'll, I'll share that HIPAA is undergoing a review currently and a number of years ago, and this is, you guys can raise your hands or just nod or make a funny face, but how many people knew that in, in HIPAA it would allow a provider to discuss addiction issues and overdose issues with a loved one. Anyone? It's been that way for five years. But nobody knew until the OIG and everybody asked for input on how should we change HIPAA. And when we were talking about it, like, well, this is a new rule, this has been there, so this is gonna stay but we were expanding it upon other different programs and things that we see chronically to be able to have a discussion with family members that doesn't violate HIPAA or other providers that aren't covered entities in HIPAA that I've been advocating for years. But that one shocked me that as a provider, I could actually have a discussion with a spouse over their husband's overdose and addiction issues to seek treatment and, and get them to a psychiatrist or psychologist where it was like, well, we can't really tell you what happened, so you want to help them, we want to assist them to get to the best need, care that they need, but we never had the conversation, but legally we were actually allowed. So that's something to advocate for is looking at HIPAA and knowing what you can and can't share because the rules are actually a little looser. But to your question that you asked about why is this in, why is this in there, is it comes down to from a HIPAA perspective of the amount of data that you store is the amount of data you have to protect. So for a lot of hospitals, the advanced directive is just a box. It's not the actual documentation because that's data that they're storing that they have to now protect. And you have to pay for that, as can be brought up, is we pay for storing data, we pay for our records that we generate in the systems. I mean, it's a whole money thing where it's like, why are we allowing people to make money off of the storage of records that are important? And then we overprotect it to no ends to where the information when it's needed, nobody has the access to get it. So that's my HIPAA soapbox. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Okay, so panel, last round here. And this is quick. You got five words or less or I'll vote you off the island, okay? Just your parting advice, you know, a gem of best practice or wish for the group. Very succinct. Starting with you, Cammie. Talk to your family. Don't wait for a medical crisis. Make a choice. Oh, man, they took all the good ones. What? <laughs> they, took all, they took all my answers, so. You're using your words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, talk about it often. Thank you. Make it legal with documents. Excellent. Hey, a big hand for the panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>